Antarctica. It was once a green land full of dinosaurs. But now it's a frozen continent bigger than that of the U.S. that doesn't belong to anyone. It isn't hard to find. Wherever you go, just go south until you get to the big icy thing at the south pole of our planet. It lies within the Antarctic Circle, and it's the largest single mass of ice on Earth. The continent is bigger than the U.S. and even bigger than all of Europe. And still, Antarctica was officially discovered recently. Scientists hadn't known of its existence until 1820. After the discovery, it took another two decades to confirm it was a whole new continent and a few more decades after that to decide on a name. In Antarctica, anti means the opposite. So Antarctica literally means the opposite of the Arctic. Now, even before scientists discovered the land, ancient Greeks already theorized that there must be a southern continent to balance out the Arctic in the north. Also, some scientists who studied Polynesian artwork and oral history believe that Polynesians found the continent over a millennia before the Europeans did. Anyways, today we all know of this icy land at the South Pole. Because of its location, there are just two seasons there, summer and winter, and both last six months. In summer, it's a bit warmer, and the continent exists in pure daylight. And in winter, it's dark all day long. 98% of Antarctica is ice. This continent alone stores 60% of the planet's fresh water. And yet, despite all those water reserves, Antarctica is the biggest desert in the world. By definition, a desert is an area with sparse vegetation and little snow or rain. Notice that plenty of sand isn't a necessary condition here, even though the continent does have some sand and even sand dunes. It also gets a lot of wind. Antarctica is the windiest continent on Earth, and wind speeds can reach 200 miles per hour. That's even faster than hurricane winds. The little snow the land gets never melts. It just builds up over time, for centuries and millennia. So there's a thick, thick ice layer there. This makes Antarctica full of hidden secrets. There's a whole new world underneath its ice. For example, there are a lot of mountains on the continent that are like 9,000 feet tall. It's taller than three Burj Khalifas stacked on top of each other, if we must. And that's currently the tallest skyscraper in the world. But we don't see all those mountains because they're all hidden under the ice sheet that is almost 16,000 feet thick. There's also a lake down there, beneath over 11,000 feet of snow. The lake is called Lake Vashtok, named after Vashtok Research Station, under which it's located. Originally, it was just a hypothesis. Over a century ago, a scientist suggested that the huge pressure created by tons of ice could decrease the melting point of ice in the lowest layers of the ice sheet, creating liquid water, which could form a lake. He didn't prove his ideas in his lifetime, but others continued his work and confirmed that this theory was true. There's also a canyon in Antarctica, hidden underneath huge masses of snow, too. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon we have in Arizona. There is a mountain range that divides the continent into two parts, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. The western part of the continent is experiencing higher temperatures and is starting to melt. If West Antarctica melts and releases its stored water, it will raise the average global sea level by about 16 feet. That will be enough for some cities all over the world to completely disappear. Perhaps the first to turn into a water world will be Thailand's capital, Bangkok, which is just 5 feet above sea level. Then it will be Amsterdam in the Netherlands, followed by Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Cardiff in the UK, and New Orleans in the US. People do a lot of work in Antarctica now, residing there for many months at a time to study this mystery of a continent. Over the years, even a few children were born there. But it's not a country, and the land doesn't belong to anyone. It's governed by the Antarctic Treaty System, an agreement of peaceful research and collaboration that suspends all territorial claims. It was first signed by 12 nations, and now there are 59 supporters, half of whom have decision-making powers. The continent is occupied all year round by researchers from all over the world. There are about 5,000 people living there in summer and about 1,000 in winter. Yet no one is a permanent resident there. People come and go, and the scientists take turns spending time there. The average yearly temperature there is negative 30 degrees. Ooh. But there was a time when Antarctica was about as warm as Melbourne, Australia is today. 
It was about 40 to 50 million years ago. Yeah, I wasn't around then. But the continent had green forests and dinosaurs roaming its land, chilling in the sun in a 63 degree Fahrenheit environment. That was before penguins. In our age, it's so cold that you won't even find any trees or bushes in Antarctica. Just the snow. The only plants that can thrive in such extreme temperatures are lichens, moss, and algae. People can't stand such freezing conditions for lengthy periods of time either. So the continent has never had any indigenous population. Well, that is, if we don't count penguins, seals, whales, and a few other types of birds that live there now. Antarctica's fauna is the scariest and least diverse on the planet because only a few organisms can withstand its harsh conditions and because non-natives aren't allowed to be brought there. So if you decide to travel to Antarctica with your cat, well, you can't. Hey, I don't make the rules. But those few species that live on the South Pole totally own the place. There are no more than 5,000 people there and around 20 million penguins. They are a kind of settlers, though. Penguins' first ancestors lived in Australia and New Zealand. There are still a few penguin species there, including the smallest penguin on Earth that is just one foot tall. Still, most of the penguins migrated to Antarctica at some point, possibly because they were attracted by the greater food supply there. It's not the cold that made them like the land. It turns out, most penguins leave the continent when the summer ends. The only ones that stay there are male emperor penguins. And they do it to warm and protect eggs left by their mates. But where do all the other penguins go? At first, it was a big mystery even to scientists. But then they attached some tiny location devices to the legs of a few of these animals and figured it out. Penguins go to live in the southern oceans while it's too cold in Antarctica. None of them go ashore for half a year until they get back to the continent. When they come back, it's when those eggs, left for male penguins to nurture, start hatching. And so, penguin families can be together when it happens. Penguins eat different fish, and the ocean is full of those despite its cold temperature. In some areas, water can reach below freezing temperatures because it's salty. But fish don't freeze there because they have antifreeze proteins in their bodies. Then there are also about a million seals in Antarctica. They like fish too and they can hold their breath underwater for two hours. They see way better underwater than in the bright light of the day, and they also use their whiskers to locate food. Their breathing holes in the ice can freeze while seals are away, and they must use their teeth to make a new one. Seals can even sleep underwater, and then resurface occasionally to get some air without waking up. I can appreciate that. Rekat's structure is a giant formation in the Sahara that looks exactly like a giant bullseye. It's so wide that you can see it from space. Even the CIA got interested in it. In 1965, they planned a flyover looking for geomagnetic anomalies. The findings are still classified. Perhaps the theories are true. And this place is truly the lost city of Atlantis. Now, Atlantis supposedly sank beneath the waves. But recent discoveries are pointing us in a different direction. This is an ancient story that goes far back in time, and Plato was the first to mention it. The place had loads of greenery and a curious structure. Three concentric circles of land surrounding two circles of water. Two key quotes from Plato's writing suggest that Atlantis might not have been a typical island in the middle of the ocean. Plus, Atlantis had a major influence from Africa and Europe, challenging the idea of it being in the Atlantic. It turns out that the Eye of the Sahara and Atlantis look alike. When astronauts saw the Eye of Sahara from above, they initially suspected a meteorite impact crater. But the rings of the structure matched the layout described of Atlantis. More importantly, the Sahara wasn't always a desert. It turned from a tropical region into a desert around 11,000 years ago. Researchers found evidence of a massive river called the Tamarasset that could have sustained a community. This river flowed toward the Rikat structure, aligning with Plato's description. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran through the Sahara 50 to 100 million years ago. The sea allegedly destroyed Atlantis around 11,500 years ago, likely due to a rapid rise in sea level caused by the end of the Ice Age. NASA's worldview imagery shows patterns consistent with this theory. Those concentric rings might be a key to unlocking the secrets of our planet's evolution over millions of years. 
They're shaped by erosion on resilient rock layers, creating a spooky pattern of ridges and troughs. The central peak stands proud at 1,300 feet. The central part has undergone a significant erosion makeover, revealing a circular structure with a raised peak. Unlike impact craters, the eye of the Sahara flaunts a striking balance and symmetry. Some say it results from rock uplift, sculpted by wind and water. Others think it's an ancient anticline, eroded to reveal its concentric glory. Then there's a salt diapir theory, suggesting that salt's buoyancy sculpted this beauty. Dating techniques have proved that it formed 541 to 252 million years ago, give or take a million or two. Ancient tools are scattered around the outer rings of the structure near riverbeds. Some older stone tools have also been spotted in the same areas. And still, even though some spear points from the Neolithic period have been found, there aren't many signs that people were living there back then. The area seems to have been used for short-term activities like hunting and making tools. There are other unearthly mysteries that haunt our world. One such enigma is in Norway the ominous Hestalen light phenomenon, also known as the Valley of Lights, leaves scientists confused. This valley is 10 miles wide. It's quite isolated, but a peculiar blue box sits high on the hillside equipped with cameras scanning the valley. The unsettling saga began in the 1980s, when the night sky over Hestalen erupted with burning fireballs, a recurring spectacle that sent shivers down the spines of those who witnessed it. This wasn't a fleeting occurrence, rather it became a regular thing. Terrified locals reported encounters with these unexplained luminous phenomena, some of which happened near their homes. Unease spread like wildfire. At its peak, there were about 20 sightings every week. The phenomenon made its way into newspapers, magazines, and media worldwide. Soon, people flocked to the valley, hoping to see the lights themselves. In 1984, experts joined the fray, armed with sophisticated instruments like magnetometers, radiometers, and other ometers. What they encountered was mind-bending, lights that defied explanation. Some moved at a leisurely pace, while others raced through the sky at an astonishing 19,000 miles per hour. People tried to explain these lights. Airplanes, distant reflections, ball lightning, satellites, planets, meteors. But the speed and how these lights danced ruled out all those theories. We're slowly approaching another mysterious place. This is the greatest subglacial lake among Antarctica's 675 known lakes. It can easily hide unknown life forms. This lake is beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. Dive about 2.5 miles under the ice, and there you'll see Lake Vashtak, located at 1,600 feet below sea level. This lake is 155 miles long and 31 miles wide at its broadest point. With an average depth of 1,400 feet, it's also the world's sixth largest by volume. It's like an underwater city with lofty pillars and deep basins. The secret lake was discovered in 1993, yet it had been waiting to be found down there for over 2,000 years, collecting ancient secrets. In 2012, scientists drilled through the ice, creating the longest ice core ever. They pierced the ice all the way to the lake surface. The year 2013 brought an unexpected twist when the tranquil waters erupted during the extraction of an ice core, mixing with drilling fluids. Then they got a pristine water sample in 2015. Some believe there might be previously unknown life forms down there, since it's a fossil water reserve that's been untouched for millions of years. They could be a lot like those speculated ice-covered oceans on moons like Europa and Enceladus. It all started with a theory in the 19th century, suggesting fresh water lurking under Antarctic ice sheets. Then, in 1955, seismic soundings hinted at a subglacial lake. And by the 90s, satellite data confirmed Lake Vashtak's existence. Now, Lake Vashtak isn't alone. In 2005, they found an island in the middle of the lake. Then, two smaller lakes join the party. They suspect that a secret network of subglacial rivers might link these lakes. Now, very far away from Antarctica, in Venezuela, Catatumbo lightning presents a sinister light show at the junction of the Catatumbo River and Lake Maracaibo. This unsettling lightning phenomenon happens at about 140 to 160 nights a year, going on for 10 hours a day. 
and can flash up to 280 times in a single hour. The frequency of this lightning show changes with the seasons and from year to year. There was a break between January to March in 2010, causing a bit of worry that it might vanish forever. As the sun sets, winds from the east start picking up speed. The strong wind is called a nocturnal low-level jet, like what you see in the Great Plains of North America. These winds bring moisture, mostly from the Caribbean and the lake itself. This humid air hits high mountain ridges, causing thunderstorms to form over the mountains. Thanks to the ongoing wind situation, more thunderstorms appear as the night goes on. This pattern repeats itself, and is why this area has the highest annual lightning rate globally. The next place scientists cannot explain is in China. That is the Longyu Caves. They have lofty slanted roofs and sturdy pillars. This spot remained hidden for centuries. These human-made caverns, built around 2,000 years ago, decided to reveal themselves only in the 90s. Local farmers drained some ponds and unveiled five massive caverns. Further digging exposed an additional 19 smaller caves. They range from 60 to 110 feet in width and 26 to 50 feet in height. Archaeologists found historical relics from the reign of Emperor Zhuan of Han, dating back to over 2,000 years ago. Now, how did these caves survive for more than two millennia without falling apart? No ancient records explain the way they were crafted, either. The walls show chisel marks, hinting at some layer-by-layer -layer chiseling action, but the exact construction process is still a head-scratcher. They say this place is swarming with money. It's been stored there for centuries, but no one managed to take it away from this island. Treasure hunters have been bewitched with this place since 1795. Many people have tried their luck looking for the treasure that could be hidden there by the Spanish pirates or even by the Knights Templar. But today, it's impossible to get there, as it's a private place. So all you can do is book an ocean tour around this island. Otherwise, you can take a peek at it in a TV reality show starring the Legina brothers, Rick and Marty who are a team of enthusiasts looking for the treasures of Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. Yeah, seems like there's no place where TV producers can't get to. One of the most famous discoveries out there was the so-called Money Pit. Despite the promising name, it wasn't full of money. Now we have to jump to 200 years ago. The Money Pit was first found by a 16-year-old kid in 1795. One day, Daniel McGuinness went fishing at Oak Island. He saw a tree there. Unsurprisingly, it was an oak, and it had weird markings. They didn't seem to be natural, so Daniel decided to check the area. He then saw a sunken patch of ground and started digging immediately. His two friends helped him out. But instead of treasures, the guys only found logs placed underground at regular intervals. It looked like a place where someone could hide money or jewels but nothing precious was found. However, there was something curious down that pit. Someone found a granite stone there, and it had an engraved inscription on it. There were many attempts to decode it, but most of them ended up in failure. There's one translation though, and it says, 40 feet below, two million pounds are buried. Yeah, McGinnis and his friends should have dug harder. The next fun thing about the money pit is the coconut fiber found down there. They say that large amounts of this fiber were found at a depth of 60 feet. It may not surprise you, but I have to remind you of one thing. Oak Island is in Nova Scotia, Canada. Coconut trees do not grow there. The nearest one is about 1,500 miles from Nova Scotia, which makes it obvious that someone brought this fiber purposefully. Researchers came up with an idea that coconut fiber could have been used to make ropes and lower all the treasures down the pit. Next up, we have not one, but two mysteries. In the late 1800s, the Oak Island Treasure Company was thoroughly inspecting and excavating the island. Everyone believed something enormous was hidden there. These guys managed to drill 153 feet underground. That's like 15 stop signs stacked one on top of the other. You might have guessed that they didn't find pounds of gold and diamonds, but they found a manuscript. There's a theory claiming that it's one of Shakespeare's lost manuscripts. 
Some scientists believe that it was hidden there by the writer and scientist Francis Bacon, the true author of Shakespeare's works. Yeah, rumor has it it was Francis and not William who wrote all the plays and sonnets. But there's no proof it was really so. The Money Pit may be the most popular shaft on Oak Island, but it's not the only one, and it's not the first. Before the Money Pit discovery, treasure hunters were drilling at Smith's Cove. While damming there, they found a wooden piece. It was a U-shaped formation that had Roman numerals. After a more thorough inspection, the specialists realized it was supposedly dated to 1769. The Money Pit was discovered 26 years later. This fact created many speculations that this structure might have been part of the real shaft with treasures everyone was looking for. Now, look at this Templar coin. It wasn't the first discovery on the island, but it was crucial in some way. Even if it may not sound like a big deal today, in medieval times, those coins would amass an insane amount of wealth. They were typically stored in European fortresses. For the treasure hunters, this coin was a sure sign there was more to be found on the island. The logic is simple. If there's one coin of that kind, there must be something else. And they were right. It wasn't the only Templar discovery. On the southwest shore of the island, a crossbow bolt was found. Experts say it dates back to the 13th century. But once again, that wasn't something the treasure hunters were after. Some more coins were found on the island. Rick and Marty Legina retrieved this precious piece from a swamp. The coin is made of copper, and this time, it originated from Spain. When it was found, the Legina brothers could only see the number 8 engraved on it. But later on, some experts studied this coin and claimed it was made sometime around the 17th century. They managed to clean it well and saw the date 1652 engraved on the back of this coin. There's a theory stating that Spanish explorers found some treasure, but hid it instead of taking it to the king. So maybe this coin just dropped out of the chest full of coins and jewels and is part of the treasure everyone was after. Or someone could have accidentally lost it while looking for the treasure. Who knows? One more famous treasure hunter is Gary Drayton. Gary and his team, together with Rick Legina, came across two coins while metal detecting the island. Those were 17th century King Charles II Britannia coins. One of them had a very clear inscription on it, stating that the coin was minted back in 1771. Another swamp treasure of possibly Spanish origin is also here. This time, it's a silver ring. A specialist studied it closely and reported that it had been repaired twice. The ring was once made bigger, and it was also made smaller ones. It's decorated with a floral design, which was popular in Europe in the 1730s. Among all the other curious things, Rick and Marty Legina found a silver button at Isaac Point. The button's pretty old. It supposedly dates back to the middle of the 18th century, and the notorious money pit was discovered later. This is why it wasn't a big deal of a find. It could simply belong to some farmer peacefully raising livestock on the island. There's no official record of any chest full of gems and coins found on Oak Island, but enthusiasts did find some jewels there. First off, the team found a brooch with a magnificent red gem. They mistakenly thought it was a ruby, but a professional gemologist stated it was a garnet. The piece was made of silver, and it's pretty old. Experts believe it was made around the 15 or 1600s. Another brooch they found didn't have any gems on it, but it had an intricate design. It's a brooch with a leaf design and an ornate rope. There are 13 branches of the leaf, which instantly created more mystery to the whole treasure hunting. First off, there's a carving with a 13-branched tree on a rock on the north shore of this island. What's more, many people believe that the number 13 is important to the Knights Templar. The enthusiasts also found a brooch not far away from the place where Daniel McGuinness, the guy who found the money pit, lived. The brooch was shown to a professional gemologist, Charles Luton Brain. He had to break it to the team that there were no gems adorning this piece of jewelry. In fact, the stone that seemed to be a gem was just a piece of glass. It was processed using a special technique, though, so it was leaded glass. The enthusiasts decided to study the brooch even more 
and found out that part of the brooch was made of gold. The specialists claim that the brooch dates back to the 14th century. Was it the treasure everyone was looking for?